we'll move over to Jim. And Jim, uh, you, you, actually, Dan, you had mentioned some working with Microsoft, and uh, Jim's going to tell us a little bit about some changes in the patching processes. So tell us about it, Jim. It's appropriate that we're talking about this on Patch Tuesday. Uh, there are 13 new patches out today, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on those since we talk about those every month. But um, last week, uh, Microsoft hosted their Ignite conference in uh, Chicago, and uh, Terry Meyerson, who's in charge of Microsoft's Windows group, um, gave the keynote there, and he talked about how Microsoft with Windows 10, which is due out later this year, uh, is going to change their their patching processes a little bit. Uh, it's not going to be one big patch Tuesday every month. For home users, they're going to start you know, making the patches available as soon as they're ready, not holding them mm -hmm. until you know the second Tuesday of the month. But they're also uh, going to have Windows Update for Business going to be one method that enterprises can use to um, collect up the, the patches, see what breaks for home users, and so they can hang on and, you know, not necessarily apply the, the patch until it's fixed. Mm -hmm. um, so it, businesses will be able to, to set their own date, you know, when within the month they want to apply patches, and they can wait, you know, a, a little bit after they've been tested out on the guinea pig home users. So. Um, I you know it's, it's, it's kind of an interesting, uh, in, interesting change uh, in, in the way they go about doing things. We'll have to see how well it works. I mean, it, it seems to work okay for, for the Linux uh, distros these mm -hmm. days. They, you know, release their patches whenever they've got them ready. And, you know, one, I think it was a, uh, um, the register article uh, that was uh, explaining this said this new policy looks sort of like app get update and apt get dist upgrade, which is you know how Debian or Ubuntu users you know find out what the new patches are and go ahead and apply them. This is a similar kind of thing. You can automate this and, and do it fairly quickly. So mm -hmm. it's it's going to be interesting to see how, how this works out. As I said, it's, it's kind of appropriate that we're mentioning this on Patch Tuesday because, as I said, there are a whole bunch of new patches again this month and three of them that Microsoft called critical and a few more that I probably would have called critical because mm -hmm. they're remote code exploit, but we've discussed that in previous months. So Okay. What are your thoughts, Dan, All right, about the changes in, in the practices here? you think this is a good thing? So there's a major trend towards what's called evergreening, mm -hmm. meaning that you don't have old browsers anymore. Who knows what versions of Chrome they're using? Mm -hmm. like coming up to 44 now. Right, right. Um, so there's a real desire to evergreen. Um, there's a real desire to evergreen the desktop, to evergreen the operating system. Mm -hmm. And the question is, is it going to work after you apply the patch? Mm -hmm. and let me tell you something. Sometimes patches break a whole bunch Sometimes of stuff. Sometimes they do, that's for certain. And that may be something of a problem for home users, but it can be repaired. Mm -hmm. And it may be a, the factory shuts down problem for businesses. <laughs> so different customers have different tolerances. Mm -hmm. What Microsoft is really trying to go towards is, can we go ahead and have our ecosystem be one ecosystem, not one with all of these various intermediate steps? Right. If we can at least get to the point where there's like the bleeding edge, the normal business, and the factory floor that absolutely never needs to change, that's at least three. Mm -hmm. And that's less than there might, might otherwise be. I'm going to be honest, it's a hard problem yeah. to patch software because there's just so many moving parts. Yeah. Google got into a ton of trouble where they had made a dependency in Chrome on a new feature in the Linux kernel. But the default Ubuntu kernel didn't have that feature. So Chrome just stopped working on Ubuntu. And as far as I know, that state continues. Mm -hmm. so, so this is, 
This is the difficulty of software. Yeah. We are constantly putting things together and hoping, dreaming, assuming it's going to work after. Chrome and Firefox have actually done a very good job of showing that, yeah, you can actually really keep updating things. But remember, the dependency in the browser world is you got to work with the latest browsers. There's an entire team at every major website that makes sure stuff still works. And let me tell you, when, they, when stuff is broken, yeah, the browser guys try not to, but the web guys go ahead and are there to fix it. Yeah. What happens when it's a business that has, like, the IT guy who's maintaining some old binary code. There is no source around. Right, right. That's the kind of guy who's like, hey, I don't want any moving parts in my operating system that are surprising me. Yeah. So it, it, it's an interesting dynamic because when you start getting into the business aspects of it, it seems like it's more going toward the needs of the many kind of thing, where the needs of the few are kind of using a Star Trek thing here, <laughs> where the needs of the few start Secure to, long to get, <laughs> but the needs of the few start to get belittled. And, and so it's that case where are there really that many Ubuntu users that of, of Chrome that needed to be out there? Is that really a priority or is, are they really just satisfying no. the, uh, the majority of the users? Uh, let me, let me tell you a busted patch ain't just going to hate Ubuntu. Okay. Yeah. There, there's, <laughs> There's been some patches that have not yeah. gone too well. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone's experienced one. Java has, Windows mm -hmm. has, the antivirus guys have. I think I've read of an antivirus patch that detected its own update as a virus. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, <laughs> updates happen. And that's yeah. why we have QA. Right. That's why you invest in it. Believe me, it'd be a lot cheaper not mm -hmm. to have QA. And a lot of companies have tried to go without and mm -hmm. Eventually, this stuff comes in waves. QA mm -hmm. does well, but is slow. People are like, let's just get rid of it and find out in the field, move fast and break things. And then they move fast and break things, yeah. and uh, things are broken, and it's really bad. <laughs> so so we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll see exactly what ends up happening here. Mm -hmm. um, there are processes and procedures where the code you end up putting out more likely to work in the first place, or you put it out in waves. Certainly one of the big ways that Chrome you may not notice it, but you, you are randomly running random future builds of Chrome all mm -hmm. the time. Right, right. And that's how they find out before they do a production release, is this something that's going to go break everything? They actually get telemetry back. It really all does come back mm -hmm. to telemetry. Yeah. This is, you know, security engineering problems are in very serious ways just more engineering problems. Yeah. Well, you know, you kind of beat me to it. You, you mentioned you know, the, the, uh, the sort of the, the pre-production releases being tested in a variety of places, it seems like this model gives Microsoft more flexibility to say, you know, let's take a sample group and deploy the patches out, depending on how critical it is, deciding how aggressively they want to push things out, you know, and take the additional risk or take a sample group and see how it's working. And if they don't get complaints or they don't get that negative telemetry back, then they can do a broader thing. And they're not waiting for monthly cycles to do that. There's, there's just a lot of A-B testing. Yeah. When Amazon wants to find out if there's a problem, they put something. Amazon wants to find out if something is interesting. Mm -hmm. They put it out there for 45 minutes to, you know, 100,000 people and they find mm -hmm. out. Right. They just know. It's not all at once. You flight this stuff out. Mm -hmm. The model that's dead is the old model of Windows where they work on a problem today and maybe the code will ship in two years. Mm -hmm. That model is over. That yeah. level of agility is insufficient to meet customer needs. Microsoft is right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Good point. I, I was just going to say it's, it's slightly different between you know, a website doing that sort of A-B testing where if something breaks, just the user can't use the website, but if you've got an you know, operating system change or a patch, it has a bigger impact. And I was wondering how you select the proper, you know, less critical section of the population to push this this patch to and say, well, you know, you 400,000 users over here, you're going to be our, our hamster or our guinea pig. Um, and um, maybe you'll work, you know, you come out on the other side okay, or maybe well, you won't. In some cases, they can have a volunteer group that does that. You can sign up for, would you like the beta releases of something to, to so you, evaluate? You but I think my suspicion is in most circumstances, I can't speak for Microsoft in this case, but my suspicion is most cases it's like, well, let's try it and, well, if, you know, if, yeah. if, let's <laughs> check Twitter so and maybe, maybe I need to reboot or something. And then <laughs> okay. Well, it's, 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 a, it's a specific style of engineering. Yeah. 
where if there's a failure, you actually have like local rollback. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, this was tried, it didn't work, don't do any damage. And you gotta be really careful when you do it and it makes mm -hmm. your patching and it makes your testing more expensive. Yeah. But the reality is, is someone's gonna be the hamster. Mm -hmm. True. So you, at least let it not be everybody mm -hmm. at the same time. And if it does, at least have it be a thing that can be pulled back. Yeah. Thus far, and I mean, through the, the question is, do we patch at all? Because you could have a model that says you can't patch at all because you only know that it worked the first time. And ever, if you ever patch, maybe you'll break it to unrecoverable state. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is that market isn't very good either. You need to have the ability to update problems. You need to have an infrastructure mm -hmm. that can survive your one out of N, where N is unknown, but not impossible. Mm -hmm. I, one out of N times, a patch is going to break things. Figure out how to survive it. That was one of the big reasons why Windows Update changed the world. Mm -hmm. It took Windows from a thing where attackers could assume that a bug today was always going to have a large population right. to one where it's like bugs had a timeline. And once they were going to go, it was like, they're going to go. Mm -hmm. That made things better. It made things a lot better. Yeah. I, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm not sure I've ever mentioned it on this show, but I absolutely agree with you. I think Microsoft really changed things when they, when they did mm -hmm. the automatic update. They weren't the inventors. They were following, I think, but the... Uh, I think they did it, they were the first ones to do it right at scale. Mm. And, and by that I mean it wasn't enough. Updating systems is hard. Yeah. Like forget all the stability issues, although they're pretty significant. And Just a secure, large diversity of different systems, yeah. And securely sending the patch mm -hmm. is actually really quite difficult at scale. Mm -hmm. Like, and I mean this because everyone keeps screwing it up. <laughs> There's a package called Evil Grade that's yeah. just like, oh, you want an upgrade? Here's some new random code for you to run. People are like, okay. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. they'll be secure unless there's a bad guy, unless someone blocks the secure side, yeah. then goes, well, I need a patch, so let me get this random code. Oh, look at this. <laughs> It must be better because it's not what I'm running now, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I wish you were joking, but that's totally the uh, the the design yeah. assumption. I'm pretending to joke here. Yeah. So.